Now, thus far, we've discussed various ways of synthesizing individual amino acids. Now, what if we want to synthesize peptides, which are, once again, chains of multiple amino acids bound together in a specific sequence? What if I want to do that? Prepare to be dazzled. I wish, of course, to begin with a hypothetical example. Let's pretend that we wanted to synthesize this dipeptide. That is, a dipeptide that has glycine first and then alanine. That seems simple, right? We should just be able to stir glycine and alanine together, and they should dimerize to form glycine-alanine peptide, right? No problem, right? Wrong. See, if I take glycine and alanine and I stir them together, and I want them to form this dipeptide, glycine-alanine, on paper, it looks like that should work just fine. The nitrogen of alanine comes in, displaces the OH or the carboxylate group on the glycine, gives me my peptide, no problem. Should work, right? The problem is that there are multiple other ways that these could dimerize. See, this alanine here, instead of attacking another glycine molecule, might, in solution, attack another alanine molecule. And if that happens, then I'll get this dipeptide, alanine-alanine. The glycine could do the same thing. It could condense onto another glycine molecule, giving me this peptide, glycine, glycine. And as you might guess, this glycine molecule might have its nitrogens come in and displace the carboxylate and the alanine to give me the opposite arrangement of the peptide that I want, alanine, glycine, as opposed to giving me glycine, alanine. Do you guys see the problem here? So what in the world can we do? How can we just get the one peptide that we want instead of this crazy mixture? I'm going to answer that in the next slide. OK, so I'm going to show you guys what to do. But I need to warn you that the method that I'm showing you here is actually a lot simpler than the one in your book. You're welcome to study both if you wish, but I highly recommend focusing on this one because it's just, for me, easier to understand. So in order to get the peptide that I want, we have to devise a way of individually inactivating the NH3 plus of one amino acid and the CO2 minus of the other amino acid. How do we do that? By individually and separately protecting them. Once we've done that, then we can react those two protected amino acids together with each other. Here's how that's done. Now glycine, which is the amino acid that I want on the left side of my dipeptide, gets treated with this crazy looking reagent right here that's called ditert-butyl dicarbonate. Now I don't want you guys to crap your pants when you see this reagent right here. It really isn't as crazy as it looks. Let me show you. What happens here is when I introduce base, the base will deprotonate this nitrogen to give me just an NH2. The lone pairs on the nitrogen come into this carbonyl, as we've seen so many times. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and then it, they kick off this whole section here that's a leaving group. That ultimately gives me this product that has this nitrogen forming this bond to this carbonyl carbon that has this tert butoxy group dangling off to the left. I want to tell you guys, this group, which is a nitrogen protecting group that's used very commonly, is uh, frequently referred to as a T-Bach group. You see that? This is called a T-Bach group. It stands for tert-butoxy carbonyl. But you guys can just call it T-Bach. Now I need to separately inactivate the oxygen here on the carboxylic acid of alanine, which is the amino acid that I want to have end up on the right. Now that's super easy to do. The way I do that is by converting this carboxylic acid into an ester. You guys have seen this reaction before. If I take this uh, amino acid and I treat it with an alcohol, and the alcohol that I'm going to pick is tert-butanol, and I also add catalytic acid, it will do this reaction. What's the name of this reaction? It's called Fischer esterification. You guys even ran it in the lab, for those of you who are in my lab class. So what I've done is I've converted alanine into the alanine tert-butyl ester. That essentially masks or inactivates this OH and converts it into this bulky, sterically cumbersome group. So what you guys can see that what I've done in these two separate reactions is I've protected the nitrogen on glycine, which is the amino acid that's going to end up on my left. 
I've also protected or masked the OH of alanine, which is the amino acid that will end up on my right. These groups that I've highlighted in these cute little colored boxes are the protecting groups for these individual portions of these molecules. Now once I've done that, I'm ready to react these two protected amino acids together. So if I take this molecule, t glycine, and I treat it with my alanine T-butyl ester and DCC, remember DCC is that reagent that sort of speeds up uh, nitrogens kicking off an OH. What will happen is this nitrogen right here will come into this carbon right here. Electrons go up, electrons go down, and it ultimately kicks off the OH. It's not truly an OH. What's occurring here mechanistically is the oxygen or the OH is being activated as a better leaving group by the DCC. If you want to see the mechanism for that, look in your book. I am not going to show it here. Ultimately, however, that forms an exclusive bond between this nitrogen and this carbonyl carbon here, which gives me this product right here. You'll see that I can't get this alanine to condense on another molecule of alanine. I can't get this protected glycine to condense on another molecule of protected glycine. And I can't get these to condense on each other in the opposite order. The reason is because I've masked the amine of one, this glycine, and I've masked the carboxylate group of the other, this alanine. So the only way these are le can be left to react, practically speaking, is to have this amine come in, condense here, and give me this amide bond shown right here. I hope that makes sense. If you need to pause it and rewatch this a couple times until it becomes clear, please do. Now at this stage, I can take off this t group, and I can hydrolyze this T-butyl group by just stirring it in aqueous acid. That gives me back this free deprotected dipeptide in the exact order as the exclusive product that I want. Now slight variations of this approach can be used to synthesize peptides containing many more than just two amino acids. Uh, in fact, an automated version of this process, which was developed by R. Bruce Merrifield, who won the Nobel Prize for it, allows efficient syntheses of peptides that can contain many, many dozens of amino acids in length to all be done automatically by machine. I don't have time to cover this automated process in detail, and I wish I did, but I will direct you guys to section 11 of your text if you wish to learn more about it. On a slightly irrelevant tangent, I should mention that I once toured a very small facility owned by a researcher who sold custom-made peptides for medical research, which she synthesized using this very automated uh, Merrifield process that I've just been discussing. Although the automated peptide synthesizer was quite expensive, I think it cost half a million or maybe a million dollars to buy, so were her fees. <laughs> As a result, she managed to pay off her synthesizer very quickly and was making, when I met her, a veritable buttload of money selling custom-made peptide chains for medical research. <laughs> well, to me, this seems like a very good place for us to stop and take a break. So I'm going to let you guys do that. I'm going to let me do that. And then we'll push on with part four, final conclusion of chapter 23. Have a good break.